<laughs> well, that will bring us to our public comment section of uh, the meeting tonight. Um, at this time, we would like to invite public comment. Please make sure that you have signed in at the back of the room or at the podium with your name and address before you come forward to speak. Public comment is limited to three minutes. Um, your time will appear on the clock on the wall and it will count down to let you know how much time you have remaining. If your comment does pertain to an action item that appears on the agenda, we would ask that you wait until that item comes up for discussion before you make your comment. You will be uh, allowed time to comment after the board discusses the item on the agenda, but before the board votes on it. Comments related to individual students, di disciplinary actions, or other matters which could be the subject of a grievance process, or comments that are derogatory of any person, business, or organization will be ruled out of order. If you would like to come up and make public comment at this time, please step forward and state your name and your address. Hello, my name is Tara Arnett. I'm here today to bring the board's attention to some recent special education inclusion issues that we've experienced. We have recently had an incident at Battle Elementary where our fifth grade special education students were left out of the graduation program. We have also had overall issues of receiving equal communication to our families. I'm not here to throw anyone under the bus or to exacerbate that situation. I believe it is being handled appropriately. I'm here because I feel like inclusion objectives for our special education students are not a priority from the district from the top down. I recently read a quote, inclusion from the bottom up is both exhausting and unsustainable. We've had some great teachers and support staff that I feel can only do so much. With district level support of an inclusion model and district expectation that inclusion is the only way, I would maybe have a more positive view of our experiences so far. My son is entering fifth grade and our elementary experience is almost at its conclusion. I hear of consistent differences from our special education families from building to building, and that's not fair. Not only do we not get a choice of which building we are in, no matter where we choose to live at, our children's educational and social growth opportunities should not depend on which building we get assigned to. Each building within the district should be subject to the same inclusion model and objectives. Another issue we've had is extended school year. This program was moved this summer from Battle Elementary to Rockbridge High for the summer. New building, new teacher, new routine, new everything. It almost feels like the person that made this decision doesn't know about autism. We elected to opt out because we thought it would cause more behavior problems than it was worth. The day for extended school year is also abbreviated from the regular education students where we can only attend from 8 to 1 p.m. For working families and for childcare for our special education students, this is almost impossible for us to do for four weeks out of the year. I would love to have this program revisited um, it seems that this program is more in favor of the district than the student. And lastly, I would just like to voice my support for the action item later, which I won't be here for. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Julie Olmstead. I live at um, and I did not come with a prepared um, statement or anything. Um, I was here for another um, group support, but um, I noticed in the agenda that there's a technology services business transaction um, that I guess was approved. It was difficult to, to hear, um, but I just wanted to advocate um, to you all. Um, my daughter is visually impaired. She's the one behind me. Uh, we've had a lot of issues with um, the district technology itself. Um, I have met with um, folks throughout the years. Um, it does seem that uh, the current technology platforms are not in the inclusion model. Um, it does exclude uh, my daughter from being able to access 
educational materials at the same time as her peers, so she's not getting um, materials in a timely manner, as is stated in the IDA. Um, and also the current um, network, I guess you could say, um, some of the filters do not allow her to uh, fully use her screen readers, um, which is essential for her to being able to access electronic material. Um, and I will turn the rest of my time over to my daughter. She has some comments as well. Thank you. Before you begin, uh, would you yes. mind starting a new timer for her, please? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lydia Olmstead, and I, just like my mom, love it. Um, and I am here today to essentially reiterate what my mom has just stated. Um, at school, I have a ton of issues with the Wi-Fi blocking essential programs on my devices. Um, it's incredibly challenging for me to access the material that I need um, because so many apps are blocked and there are so many restrictions that it is nearly impossible to access my education. Um, and additionally, as my mom stated, there are many platforms that are inaccessible. Um, these include OneNote, Schoology, Home Access, and many others. And I'm sure as you guys are well aware, these are very commonly used and um, all of my peers use them to access their education and to receive material. And uh, since I am unable to access these platforms, it's really difficult for me to access my education in the same way that my peers do. And um, it's also really difficult because I'm not able to see my grades in home access. Um, I have never been able to see my grades in the way that my peers have. And I wanted to bring this to your attention because I'm sure that you are really committed to inclusivity and I am confident that you will take action to resolve these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment. No, no list. I didn't know there was an order or nope. <clears throat> that works. Good evening, I'm Tracy Wilson, Cleek Camp. I'm res president of Race Matters Friends. I live in um, Race Matters Friends was recently tasked with being an advocate for Candace Barnes and her daughter. Um, relative to an incident that happened in January <laughs> at Smithton Middle School um, where her daughter was misidentified and arrested for being in a fight that she wasn't in. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it other than I'm just going to express my concerns that throughout the process one of the things I have not seen is restorative work. I think that's really important. I'm concerned about I think there should be a better overlay of communication between the police department, the school resource officer, and the schools. Um, and I think it'd be, I've suggested this to the chief that the officers attend the restorative practice uh, trainings. Maybe we should have them more than once a year. Maybe open them up to the public. Maybe they're open already and I don't know about it. I'd love to have someone come to Race Matters Friend meeting and, and do re restorative practice training or whatever that is that you do. Um, I also want to just reiterate that what's been filed is a complaint. It's not a lawsuit. The great thing about a complaint is it allows people to exhaust their administrative remedies to solve problems, and the way we solve them is to talk about them. When we hide from them, when we don't talk about them out loud, it gives the impression that people have something to hide. And I know that no one has anything to hide. The other thing is people just make mistakes. It happens, it happens, right? So we do much better when we talk about them openly. And so I'm gonna encourage you to take that upon yourself when you get a complaint, 
uh, let's try not to hide underneath that there's a complaint, but rather let's deal with it head on. We all do better and can be, can be better humans together when we talk about it out loud together. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Candace Holmes Barnes. Um, I live um, to go with what Miss Tracy Kleekamp said, um, my daughter was involved in a fight that she did not commit in January, and here it is, June. Um, so I filed a complaint. I just don't understand why CPS or um, the police department don't want to have an open discussion on what happened and what we need, who we need to hold accountable and what we need to do to fix the problem. Um, my daughter has had severe problems with bullying. Um, the guy that pushed her has threatened to kill her, hang her from a tree, shoot her. This is what we do. Um, she has tried to commit suicide in February because of this incident um, from Zoloft. Um, she's a very she's very depressed and she doesn't understand why this even happened to her. She was sent to the police department, fingerprinted and sent down to JJC. Um, then the next day, when we got the video, she was released and all charges were dropped. But it still doesn't matter. She's affected by this problem, and I don't understand why I filed a complaint for people to make changes and to apologize and to hold people accountable not to shut down on me and don't want to answer any problems or answer any questions when we need answers it's June it happened in January um, I have reached out and reached out and reached out to CPS I've reached out and reached out to the police department and no one has answered me or my lawyers and I'm just concerned about that and I hope CPS will do something better um, when it comes to holding themselves accountable and to have an open conversation when there's a, a complaint filed. It's not a lawsuit, it's a complaint. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Chad McLaurin. Um, I was also privy to the um, discipline board with Ms. Camp and Barnes. Um, my, my impression, my, my takeaway from that is um, there's been multiple cases of bullying going on with, with this particular case. These are things that, in my opinion, the school officials should have been aware of. They should have intervened in a manner that was um, kind, of, kind of prescriptive as opposed to reactionary in a lot of ways. Coming back from, for example, being falsely accused and imprisoned over something she did not commit was a huge violation of the trust of a 14-year-old girl who looks to these men and women to be kind of like the adult model for behavior. That responsibility is kind of part of the things you learn when you're in school. Um, I think that was a blatant violation of trust, the fact that, number one, they allowed it to proceed without due diligence and did not fall back on any kind of recourse or action to, to correct this issue. There were no apologies ex issued. There was no fact-finding done. Evidence was available, and they just chose not to, to explore it. So at a minimum, I'm, I'm very concerned that um, part of the staff has an issue with like not living up to what I feel was like due diligence. Uh, as part of that meeting as well, uh, there are a couple things that are kind of impressed on me. This is probably the third or fourth time this young girl has been bullied, physically assaulted uh, in the school system. And um, I, I honestly can't say I blame her. When you have somebody who sends you a picture, like, like she mentioned, with death threats in it, what happened to the intervention of the young boy who sent that picture to her? That's, that's terrorist activity that we're talking about. This is threatening somebody's life we're talking about, and there was nothing done, to my knowledge. Maybe that's something the school has resolved, but it's quiet. I mean, I, I really don't know that anything has been addressed on that issue. And if she's fighting back against that kind of thing, I really can't hold her at fault. And yet the two things that I heard out of that meeting that really kind of impressed upon me was that, um, number one, that she need to take a responsibility for her actions that she needs to not let things get to her. I'm sorry, that should get to her. That should get to any adult that ever sees that, any friend, peer, any sane individual. That should have been, that, that should have been a big red flag for intervention. And yet, again, I, I heard no account of that. Um, and, and the second thing, like her working on herself, when, when she was presenting to the board, um, for like corrective issues and she, she admitted freely that okay yes maybe I can work on shoring up my own defenses maybe um, not let things get to me you know take accountability for my, my, my actions and so on and so forth that was absent from the disciplinary committee 
they were at fault if they were not just either complicit or through omission um, of a lot of this thing. This could have been headed off a long time ago at the pass. And at no time did I hear them accept responsibility for the fact that they failed to step up and intervene in a way that responsibility dictates. Um, so I don't know if this is like a one-off. I don't know if this is like a case of people just having a bad day and it comes down on record. But I would suggest that this is something to look into. I imagine it's not an isolated event. It may be, but thank you. it's a huge concern. My name is Carla Hurtado. I didn't anticipate speaking at this time, but um, with the prior gentleman's comments, it's not an isolated incident. Um, I was made privy to an assault on a bus in October by a former student, and an entire, you know, select group of students were very upset. When I spoke to STA, they immediately admitted that yes, this bus driver was at fault for not um, issuing a t ticket, and he was aware of the situation, stopped the bus. Um, so the parent, an LEP parent, knew enough to call the police. And there is a disconnect between Columbia Police Department and resource officers. Because when I followed up and phoned the resource officer, he said I was the first person to contact him. Children should not feel afraid. And I'm glad I was the adult they came to, but I am not affiliated with Columbia Public Schools anymore. They just know that I'll find answers in trying to have a discussion with the schools or follow through on, on what's missing, again, silence. And um, when the tapes were played, they were atrocious. There was no provocation. The student had uh, minor physical evidence, but the description by my former student that when he got off the bus, all of his friends cried and hugged him after and the student's confusion as to why isn't anything being done at the school. Um, it's not a single incident, and it should be explored. Safety first. A feel, child who feels unsafe can't learn, and that spreads like wildfire. Thank you. Any further public comments? Seeing none, that brings us to the